Well, good morning, Northland. Hey, it is good to be with you. Let's extend a warm welcome to our extended Northland family at Ponce Inlet. Oh, we have a group meeting in New York. Oh, we have people from all over the world. And then I got some friends that have been meeting in Paris, Tennessee, that they continue to grow. And they're friends of my dad's. And so if they're friends of my dad's, they're friends of mine. But Sonny and Lisa Forbes and all of that group in Paris, Tennessee, will you welcome the them. Like we're so, so grateful. My dad, he sends me pictures that they send him. And so just really, really in- incredible what God's doing really throughout the world. Well, if you have your Bible, you know, we're in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter two, looking at these letters, these uh, autonomous, independent letters that Jesus sent these seven churches. And he's going to reveal some things. And these uh, revelations that he's given them are meant to exhort them to revolutionary living, that Jesus's followers are to be different than the world. Uh, We ought to think different. We ought to act different. And so these letters are meant to encourage and exhort the church to revolutionary living. And so as I was studying the letter to the church at Pergamum, I really thought about this word, misalignment. Everybody say misalignment. Misalignment. Now, when I was thinking about that word misalignment, I thought about when I first started going to the chiropractor. Like, he's like, man, your body's so jacked up. It is so out of alignment. And, you you know, and he put me on the table. Then he took my two legs and he bent them forward. Do you see how your right leg's longer than your left? I'm like, I thought just God made me that way. No, man, you you so out of alignment. And and then there's times when I go to the the car shop or the auto body shop. And they're like, you need some, some rotation in your tires. You need to have your tires rotated because they are out of alignment. Uh, There are times. Sometimes my wife just kind of wants to remind me that uh, you need to put out, you know, put up your clothes because they are out of alignment. They need to be in your drawers, not on top of your dresser. Can I get an amen to, from some women? All right. So, amen. I, I get it. I get it. it. It's a struggle. So, but, but also when I think about misalignment, I think about football. Anybody glad that football season is back? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of you Florida State fans, Notre Dame fans, not so much, but nevertheless, We love you and Jesus loves your team. But when I think about misalignment, I also think about football. I actually thought about this play that happened last season uh, between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. And uh, there is a misalignment here. Don't know if you can spot it, but, but if you can, great. If not, let me help you out. Here's a circle. This guy's off sides. But in that play, this guy's going to catch the ball for a touchdown, but because he was out of alignment, there was this misalignment, and they called him for offsides. The touchdown got called back. See, this idea of misalignment plays such a huge role in the life of believers. It plays such a huge role in the life of Jesus's church. Because when we get out of alignment, Jesus is going to throw a yellow flag and go, hey, you are out of alignment. I need you to get back in alignment. Uh, So with that, let me give you the main point that we're going to be fleshing out this morning. Uh, Revolutionary living requires actions that are aligned with our authority. We need to make sure that our actions are aligned with our authority. Christians, the church, we need to make sure that how we are living, how we are behaving are in alignment with our authority and our authority is King Jesus. So I'm just gonna ask you, you know, are are your actions, are your behaviors in alignment with King Jesus? If you profess him, are your actions or your alignment or your actions, your behaviors, are they in alignment with King Jesus? So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, the letter to the church at Pergamum. Here's what Jesus writes. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. 
You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Like he, does he have an apartment there? Does he have like an address where, where he lives, where he's thrown? I'm going to explain all that here in a second. So hold your horses. Verse 14 though, Jesus says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. Why? So that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We saw the Nicolaitans in the letter to the church at Ephesus. Verse 16 says, repent therefore, otherwise... I will soon, Jesus says, come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give some of the hidden manna to them. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Let's pray. Father, may you be glorified. Jesus, I pray that you would be the center of our lives. You'd be the center of Northland Church. I pray, Spirit, that you would go to work among, amongst us right now and, and that you will give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and mind to understand, a heart to receive the truth. I, I pray that we would even become comfortable with discomfort. And that you would work in such a way as to shape and mold us more into the image of Jesus. I pray for those who are far from you. That you would draw them to the beauty, uh, the, the authority, uh, the grace, the love, the transforming power of Jesus. Will you draw them to our King? For it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. All right, so four things that Jesus reveals to the church at Pergamum. And I really think these will resonate with us today. Number one, the first thing that he reveals is what was in alignment? What was in alignment there at the church in Pergamum? I know where you live, Jesus says, where Satan has his throne. Yet you, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where who lives? Now, what in, that, what, what in the world's going on here? Satan's got his throne. Satan's got his palace, his dwelling place. Like, what, what, what does this mean? Well, this is where when you're studying the Bible, it's always helpful to understand the backdrop. So, uh, it's, 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 it's important to understand the context. Now, as I was studying the context and the background, there's three options here that Jesus could be getting at when he says, this is where Satan's throne is, this is where he lives. The first option is this, is that in Pergamum, in the city, that's where the temple to Zeus was. Now, when you go to Pergamum today, you're not going to see the temple of Zeus. It has been destroyed, but this is actually in Berlin, Germany, where they have reconstructed the temple to Zeus that would have been there in Pergamum in around AD 94, 95, 96. Now, I think you know this, but in the Roman Empire, uh, there was the worship of many gods, which we would call polytheism. Now, in the pantheon of gods, who was the mightiest and the strongest god of gods? Who, who was he? Zeus, until Thor came along and beat him in God of Thunder. But nevertheless, but yeah, some of you will get that. But, but yeah, so Zeus was the God above all gods. So, so that's one option that this is where Zeus's temple, his, his cult really was pronounced and many people would travel so that they could worship Zeus here in Pergamos. That's one option. The second option is the temple of Trajan. And, and so this was fascinating. Uh, Pergamum was the first city to build a temple to Caesar. And the first temple that they built to Caesar was for Caesar Augustus in around 29 BC. And, and so there was a huge emperor cult 
there in Pergamum. So people would also travel to, to come and pay their respects to sacrifice to Caesar. Uh, because Caesar believed that he was the son of God, that he was Lord. That's the reason why you would have to come to this temple. Uh, you would have to burn incense, uh, give a sacrifice. And when you did that, you were to say, Caesar Curios is Caesar is Lord. So that could be your second option. Uh, a third option, uh, w w which uh, I, 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 you know, th this really weirds me out, but there was a temple to Asclepius. Now, Asclepius, when I first saw that word, I'm like, man, how, I'm from Tennessee. How do you pronounce that? So I have been working on that pronunciation all week long, but that's how you pronounce it, Asclepius. But, but Asclepius was the God of healing. So this was a statue of Asclepius. He had a staff, but around his staff was a snake. When we first see Satan come on the scene in the Bible, what does he appear as? A snake. So th 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 those are your three options. Now what's interesting about the temple of uh, Asclepius is that if you were sick and, and nothing that you did brought healing, it, you could actually come to the temple of Asclepius and, and you could kind of check in and go, hey, I'm here, I got this disease and I need, I need Asclepius to heal me. And so they would let you come into the temple and you would spend the night at the temple of Asclepius and you would sleep on the floor. But let me tell you what was also on the floor, all kinds of non-poisonous snakes. And so as you would sleep at the temple of Asclepius, all of these snakes would slither on you. And if you were healed, you came out of the temple and you would say, I'm healed. And they would have you write your name on a stone that you have been healed by the God of Asclepius. Hey, here's the thing. No, thank you. I'll die before I let some snake crawl on me. But anyways, people would travel, I mean, miles to come to the temple of Asclepius. So those are your three choices. But, but as I read, uh, you know, a lot of commentators and scholars, there, there are many of them that actually believe it's all of the above. And what's really going on here when Jesus says this, this city, Pergamum, is where the throne of Satan is, is where he dwells, what he's getting at is that the city of Pergamum was a stronghold for Satan. This is where Satan had a stronghold. Because when you look at these temples and you look at what was going on in the city of Pergamum, here's really what Satan's stronghold represents. And let me show you here is that it represents idolatry. So there was just temple after temple here in Pergamum. It also represented political power because they had a temple to the emperor. And so they were very loyal. And so because they were very loyal, they had political power, they had political capital. Also, it was a city of immorality, especially sexual immorality, because they had all of these temples, all of these cults, all of this temple prostitution. I mean, sexual immorality was rampant. And then they had such a focus on healing with the temple to Asclepius. Now, when I think about Satan's stronghold in the city of Pergamum, listen, I don't have to think very, very much for, for me to come to the conclusion that in America today, Satan has a stronghold. Amen. And you need to know that. If you are a follower of Jesus, you need to know at this point now in America, Satan has set up a stronghold. I mean, idolatry is all over the place. You say, Josh, what is idolatry? Idolatry is the worship of anything or anyone other than God. It's ascribing worth, it's ascribing significance and value to anything other than God. So it's things that you live for more than God, it's things that you love more than God, it's things that you long for more than God. And so when you look at Pergamum, I mean, again, they had a temple to Zeus, they had a temple to the emperor, they had a temple to Asclepius, they had other temples to other various gods in the pantheon of gods. But also think about political power. I mean, we are in a political season. At some point, I, I, I hope that I can move on with using these as an examples. And some of you, I wish you would, but you hang on. After November, I will. But, 
But, but if you look at America right now, I'm telling you, political power, that is the fight between the right and the left. Who has the power so that they can control what America looks like? And then I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, th- this has gone over your head, but uh, if you've been in Florida any amount of time, Florida is what we call a swing state, a battleground state. I mean, so this is a, this is a uh, kind of a, a concentrated place of power uh, where they're all using so much money to try to gain political influence and power here in Florida. Uh, and, and then when you think about immorality, oh my gosh, this is, I mean, we are in the new sexual revolution here in America. You just do whatever you want to do with whoever you want to do it, whenever you want to do it, however long you want to do it. Like there, there are no rules anymore when it comes to your sexuality. If you can think it, if you can dream it, and it feels good, do it. And then about healing. Now, if you think about the focus that we have on healing, is that we have counseling and therapy and psychology. Uh, we have psychiatrists. Uh, you, you cannot, you know, even watch TV if you still watch commercials without seeing commercials with the new kind of drug that has come out that's going to bring some kind of healing. I mean, they even got a drug now for your lazy husband. It's called Go Joe. I'm just joking. They don't have that. But <laughs> get, 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 Go Joe, get to work. Anyways, uh, but, and again, I'm not saying don't take drugs that would bring healing. I'm not telling you don't go see a counselor. I'm not, I'm not telling you don't get therapy, but you have to understand in the church, you know, in the church at Pergamum, they are living in a city where the focus is on everything else but God, but Jesus. And so what I'm saying here is that in our context, in our culture in which we live, there is so much focus on everything and everyone but Jesus. And this is Satan's stronghold. But did you see what Jesus said to the church at Pergamum? Even where Satan lives, even where he has his throne in his stronghold, you have remained faithful. You have held on to my name. This whole idea of holding fast to the name of Jesus has to do with identity. Uh, They have held on to their identity in Jesus, even in a city where it was really hard, where the cultural pressures were really real. Let me ask you, if you are a follower of Jesus, how well are you doing being faithful to Jesus within Satan's stronghold? Because I know that many of you, you work at, you work at a place, man, Satan's stronghold, man, it's there. How faithful are you? Man, you got some friends, you got some family members. It is just hard to be faithful to Jesus. How are you doing remaining faithful to his name? And Jesus is affirming. He is applauding the church at Pergamum for remaining faithful even in the midst of a city with idolatry, immorality, and even intense persecution. But here's the second thing Jesus reveals. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Could you imagine you're at the church of Pergamum, the pastor's reading the letter, and you like start high-fiving each other like, woo, he said, man, we remain faithful. But then the pastor goes, but Jesus has these things against you. Man, your heart would sink. You're like, man, what what does he have against us? And here's what he says. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, this is fascinating, is that Jesus is going to bring up some Old Testament characters in Balaam and Balak. Now, let me give you a little bit of background with Balaam and Balak. Now, Balaam was a prophet for hire. So basically, he was a preacher for hire. He was not a Jew, so he, he was a Gentile, but, but he would preach and bless and curse people for living. And then you had Balak, who was the king of Moab, which was an arch enemy of Israel. And so Balak sees just how strong, in some sense, Israel is, how uh, they're getting victory after victory. They're on their way to the land of Canaan, a land that God had promised them. And so Balak 
wants to hire Balaam, the prophet for hire, to go out and curse Israel. Well, so Balaam's like, I need some money. You know, inflation's a little high. Sure, I, I, I will be the prophet for hire. I'll be a huckleberry. I, I'm gonna go out and get the job done. Well, so he gets his little donkey and he and his donkey, they hightail it towards Israel because he's getting ready to curse them. Well, on the way, the reason why I remember Balaam is because I remember the story as Balaam and the talking donkey. Don't know if you remember that in Sunday school. Don't know if you remember that in uh, the things that you, you would do like vacation Bible school. But we have Balaam on his donkey, and as, as they are approaching Israel, there is an angel of the Lord that is standing in the middle of the road. Well, the only, the only thing that can see the angel of the Lord is the donkey, and the donkey stops, and Balaam doesn't know why his donkey has stopped. He doesn't know why his donkey is stubborn. Uh, He kicks the donkey, he yells at the donkey, he beats the donkey, and the donkey does not move. In fact, he's not gonna go forward. And then the next thing you know, the donkey crushes Balaam's leg. Balaam is even more ticked off about the donkey. He's hitting, he's screaming, he's yelling at the donkey. The donkey still will not move. Next thing you know, the donkey just falls down to the ground. Balaam, at this point, he wants to call the donkey some, some, some choice names that I can't say from the stage. And at that point, Balaam is like, I would kill you if I had a sword. And it was basically at that moment, the, the donkey begins to talk to Balaam. And like, why do you keep yelling at me? Why do you keep beating me? So it's a Dr. Doolittle moment. He's like, I can't go forward. There's something, there's someone in the way. And at that moment, the Lord revealed himself to Balaam and Balaam knew right then he cannot curse God's people. And what you will find is in Numbers 23 and 24, instead of cursing God's people, Balaam blesses Israel. He blesses God's people. But something happens though. Something happens, and here's what we read in Numbers. While Israel was staying in the land of Shittim, no, I did not cuss, the the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. So it's interesting, God's protecting Israel. He's protecting them from Balaam and Balak to curse them. But what we read a couple of chapters later is that now Israel... And the men, uh, they're intermarrying, they're, they're you know, integrating with Moabite women and they're leading, those Moabite women are leading these men astray. What happened? Glad that you asked. Numbers 31 tells us this. So they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Let me help you out with what was going on in Numbers uh, 23 through Numbers 31. I'm going to give you some images here. So, so Balak hired Balaam to curse God's people. And God had protected his people from the outside. He, he wanted to protect his people from the enemy and enemies. And so God's protection hovered over his people. But what Balaam did is that He told Balak, hey, listen, if we cannot curse God's people from the outside, let's kind of go around and plant some heretical ideology, some heretical theology in their midst saying that it is okay to engage with Moabite women and they will turn their hearts from God. So we'll destroy them from the inside. And that's exactly what happened. If Satan cannot get to God's people from the outside, he'll plant people in demonic teaching in the inside. I'll destroy them from the inside. And that's exactly what's going on here in the church of Pergamum is that Jesus tells them that the spirit of Balaam is alive and well through the Nicolaitans. Now, what were the Nicolaitans teaching? Well, 
here's basically what they were teaching. You can go to church and the temple and God does not care. Uh, you can go and you can observe the Lord's Supper, communion, and you, you can ascribe worth to Jesus, remembering what Jesus has done for you. And then you can also go to the temple of Zeus. You can go to the temple of Apollos. You can go to the temple of Caesar. And you can participate in all of the festivities there. You can participate in the potluck there. Like you can go to church and to the temple and Jesus does not care. And, and then while you're at the temple, I know that they do uh, sexual immorality in a variety of ways. And hey, listen, because Jesus loves you, because he's already saved you, you just do you. Whatever you want to do, just know that you've already been forgiven. So have fun at the temple. That's basically what the Nicolaitans were teaching. So that Jesus' followers can live a compromised life and he does not care. Now, now this is where, this is where when I'm studying scripture, it, it becomes a little challenging at this point because we don't have a temple to Zeus. Or we don't have a, a temple to Caesar. Or we don't have a temple to Asclepius. So how, how do we apply this to us today? Where if Satan cannot curse God's people front and center, he's gonna go around and he's gonna begin to plant heretical teaching in the body to get you to live a compromised life. What does that look like? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm gonna give you characteristics, five characteristics of teachers that might be Nicolaitans today. And then I'm gonna give you six characteristics of what a Nicolaitan student and adherent might look like today. Let's look at the leaders first. Nicolaitan teacher, preachers, leaders seem to be in it for themselves. So how do you spot a Nicolaitan teacher today? Well, you, you, you look at them and go, man, it seems like you are in it for yourself. Let me explain what I mean. So with these Nicolaitan teachers, when they came into this body of Christ, this local church, and they began to tell the church that you can do the church and you can do the temple and Jesus does not care. That would have become a very popular teaching. And so you also have to look at Balaam. Balaam was a prophet for hire, so he's in it for himself. So when, when you're trying to spot a Nicolaitan teacher, again, it's hard to understand. And again, I'm not telling you to judge people. And sometimes it's really hard to understand what's in someone's heart. But if you watch them enough, you can kind of understand if they're in it for themselves or if they're in it for Jesus. Because if they're in it for Jesus, they don't care about their popularity. Here's the second characteristic. Uh, they, they like to tickle ears by telling people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Could you imagine you're in this city? You got the cultural pressures of Satan's stronghold. You got intense persecution that if you're trying to remain true to Jesus, you're facing all of these pressures. Yet you have these leaders that come into the church and say, hey, hey, let's forget about those pressures. Let's forget about Satan's stronghold. Hey, listen, you can do the church and do that and it's okay. Could you imagine? Oh man, you tell, you tell me it's okay to live in Jesus, and also live in and be of the world? Okay, yeah. Here's a third characteristic. That they would avoid teaching on sin, the distinctiveness of Christian ethics, like the distinctiveness of Christian ethics when it has to do with our sexual and moral ethics, and they would avoid teaching on suffering. So if you're trying to spot a Nicolaitan teacher, they're not gonna talk about sin. It's just too harsh, too heavy. And they're not gonna talk about the Christian distinctiveness of how we ought to live morally and sexually. They're just not even going to go there. They're not even going to put it on their website as if they should be ashamed of Jesus' teaching on this. And then they won't even talk about suffering. They won't talk about the fact that Jesus, if you're going to follow him, he tells you you need to have this mentality of death, that you need to die to yourself so that you can live to me. And yes, that is a life and a road of suffering. Here are a couple other characteristics. Uh, they will focus on the gullibility of gimmicks to win people, not the glory of God. And here's what I mean by that. And, and no lie, I, I, I'm not making this up. 
But last Easter, I, you know, I, I follow a lot of people on social media and I, I saw this one church that advertised their Easter services and part of their marketing was come to our Easter services for a chance to win a new car. <laughs> wow, I need a new car? <laughs> how, how do you win that again? Like, no lie. And then when you think about gimmicks uh, of churches, there, there are a lot of times where churches will just bait and switch people. But, but when it really comes down to gimmicks, it's where they put all of the eggs in the attractional basket. They, they try to, you know, kind of glossy up their, their self to, to attract you with what, what you might want, where, where they'll tickle your ears. And, but here's the thing that I want you to realize is that what you win people with, you win them to. If you win people with gimmicks, and at some, point, at some point the gimmicks fade, then they will fade with the fading gimmicks. But if you win people with the glory of God, the beauty of God, the majesty of God, the transforming power of God, they will be far less to leave the glory but they'll be far more leaving the gimmicks. But here we go. Uh, the last characteristic is teaching is not transformative. So Nicolaitan leaders and teachers, they just don't have transforming teaching. I mean, so, so the teaching that they were doing here was basically you can live in the church and you can live in the world and be of the world and there is no difference. And what we see here in Revelation 2 is that Jesus reveals himself as him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Well, what does that mean? That means he's the authority. That means he has the sword, the, the power. And he has a double-edged sword, which means that he has the transforming power. And, and how does Jesus exercise his authority? How does Jesus exercise the transformation through his word? That's why he's the word of God. You see, if you are under a teacher who is in alignment with Jesus, that teaching is going to cut. That teaching is going to be powerful. That teaching is going to be transformational because it is, it is leading you to Jesus and his authority and you will be shaped and molded more into his image. But if you sit under a Nicolaitan, you will not be challenged to be more like Jesus. Uh, that teaching will be more messy. That teaching will be more dull. That teaching will be more chopped up. That teaching will be more confusing and chaotic because it is not, it is not leading you to be more like Jesus. And, and here, I'll give you just a little bit even deeper understanding of the difference between a Nicolaitan teacher and a Christ-centered teacher. Is a Nicolaitan teacher might tell you that you can do everything on your own. A gospel-centered, Christ-centered teacher would say, you cannot live the life of Jesus on your own. The only way you can do it is through the power of the Spirit. And so, yeah, yeah. And I'll just warn you, there are a lot of Nicolaitan teachers out there today, alive and well, the Spirit of Balaam, alive and well in America, in churches. Y'all all right? All right, here, here's how you can spot a Nicolaitan student is that they want to hear something that makes them feel good rather than something that makes them godlier. Let me ask you this. Did you come here? And I think you know by now if you've been here that, listen, you ain't gonna get your ears tickled. I mean, I might try to say some things funny every now and then just to, you know, loosen you up just a little bit. But, but you're gonna you go get the word. You're gonna be challenged to be more like Jesus. But I know that there are a lot of people when they hop up on me in church, what are they gonna tell me so I can feel good? Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, man, life's tough. And yes, you need to be encouraged, you need to be loved, you need to be cared for. But at the end of the day, you need to be challenged to be more like him, not to make you feel good. Worry about your feelings, as if this is a segment with Oprah or a Tony Robbins conference. 
It's not. Here's another characteristic is this, is they'll, they'll stop at God loves me just the way I am. They'll just focus on, well, God loves me just the way I am. Okay, I just want to say time out. Yes, it is so true. God loves you. God loves you where you are. God loves you in your mess. God loves you in your brokenness. God loves you in your confusion, your uncertainty. God loves you in your darkness and depravity. But he sent Jesus to enter into our brokenness. He sent Jesus to enter into our mess. He, in, he sent Jesus to enter into our depravity and darkness because he loved us too much to leave us that way. Amen. But they'll just focus on God loves me just the way I am. Hey, here's another characteristic is that they don't have holiness as part of their Christian vocabulary. Listen, if you don't have holiness on your mind and you are a follower of Jesus, I'm begging you to recapture that word. And what holiness means is distinct, separate. Jesus has redeemed us and saved us and delivered us from sin so that we might be separate and distinct from the world. We need to recover that word. Here are a couple others. They'll say, to God, you can have this in my life, but you can't have that in my life. God, you, you, you can have this. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit. Let's see what I got in my pocket that you can have. All right, you can even have a, you know, a weekend here. You, you might can even have two weekends. But no, you can't touch my sexuality. That's mine. No, God, you can't, you can't touch my wallet. That's mine. No, God, you can't touch, my, can't touch my family. That's mine. Like, you can have this. You just can't have that. When Jesus bought you with his blood, he bought the whole you, not just part of you. But I'm telling you, that teaching, those students are alive and well today in churches across America. And the last two, here we go. An imbalance focus on the love of God to the detriment of the glory of God. Oh, God is love. God is love. He's all sunshine and rainbows. Oh, I just love the love of God. Love of God. Love of God. And here's the thing, I say imbalance because yes, we ought to focus on the love of God. For God so loved the world. Romans five, but God demonstrates his love for us. Like yes, the love of God is a central theme and theology in scripture. But I want you to realize this, when you understand that God loves you and you've received God's love for you, his love becomes fuel for you to glorify him. But see, there's a lot of people in the church, oh, I just love God, God just loves me, I can live any way I want to. No, 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 no. He loves you with a relentless, never-ending love so that you can glorify him with a relentless, never-ending life. Amen. And then the last is this, is uh, they'll have an inconsistent service to the Lord in his church. And the reason why they'll have an inconsistent service to the Lord in his church is because Nicolaitan teaching is all about the person and not about God. Not about Jesus. So, what's fascinating? Do you know what the word Nicolaitan means? Here's what the word Nicolaitan means. A destroyer of people. So here's what Jesus is saying is that you've let these heretical teachers come in. And if you let, if you let their teaching take a hold here at the church, they will destroy my people. I'm gonna tell you, that there are a lot of churches today in America filled with Nicolaitan teaching that is destroying the people of God here in our context. Because this kind of compromised doctrinal teaching destroys the witness of his church. The third revelation that Jesus gives them is how do they get back in alignment? So they're in alignment here. They're out of alignment by tolerating this teaching, but how do they get back in alignment? <laughs> here he goes, repent. Everybody say repent on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Repent. Oh, y'all good. That's good. All right. Yeah. Repent just simply means change your mind. You're walking this way, walking this way. Jesus comes, says, I need you to repent. You turn, you change your mind and you begin walking with Jesus again. That, that's repent. Now, let me go a little bit deeper here, though, because I, I asked this question. I wrote it down in my notes. Why didn't the church leaders of Pergamum not deal with them before? Don't know. Uh, maybe because they were trying to keep the peace. But here's the thing. When you're trying to keep the peace at, at a church 
to the detriment of doctrinal purity, that's not Christ's peace. And maybe, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, Jesus is saying, it's a big deal. So why was Jesus so serious about this? Because wayward teaching leads to wandering people. And wandering people tend to leave the wondrous savior. And he knew tolerating this teaching and letting it infiltrate the church would jeopardize the integrity of God's people. This is really good right here. And when you, here's the thing, when your integrity is threatened, when your integrity is called into question, there are only a few options that you have in response. And let me explain. So if you've been here any amount of time, you've seen me teach on this formula. Is identity is who you are, plus function is what you do, equals image, who or what you reflect. So identity, who you are, function, what you do, your behaviors, your actions, your activities, equal what or who you reflect. Let me tell you what was going on in Pergamum. So Pergamum was a stronghold of Satan. So their identity and function and what they imaged was all about the world. They're imaging the God of this world, Satan. They're imaging the kingdom of man, which is all about man, not about God, all about man. So that's where all of the weight sit. Now, when you think about integrity, integrity is the wholeness that reflects identity. So when you live in the world and you are of the world and you don't know Jesus, I mean, you really don't even know what's whole. You, you just do what, what you wanna do, how you wanna do it, when you wanna do it. And so there's really no integrity in the sense of, you, you know, you have to do this, this is who you ought to be identifying with and this is what you ought to reflect. That's the reason why the world is a mess. Think about a mirror that has been shattered. There is no whole picture the world gives off because there is no true identity. There is no really true function or law that they live by. Therefore, they are just reflecting a bunch of chaos mess, okay? But that, that was Pergamum. But then you have the church at Pergamum. And so the church at Pergamum their identity is in Jesus. Their function, how they live, their ethics in Jesus. Who they are supposed to be imaging is the glory, the beauty, the kingdom of God in Jesus. And so integrity is kind of their whole self that reflects their identity, Jesus. Well, the Nicolaitans, they come in and give this heretical teaching. And basically what they say is that you can have a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of the world. But the problem is Jesus did not teach that. You either get all of me or none of me. You either faithful to me or you're not faithful to me. There, there's no middle ground. Uh, there's no balanced approach here. And so, but that's what the Nicolaitans were teaching. And what Jesus is telling the church is that you need to repent, that I have something wrong with you about tolerating this heretical teaching. There is now something that has gone on in the body that has called into question your integrity of reflecting me well. And so here's what happens though. Here's the principle, let me teach it to you. When you do things that go against who you are, and what you are to image, that's called, everybody say it. It's why a lot of people have been turned off by the church because of hypocrisy in the church. You say you love Jesus, you say you follow Jesus, but you act like this, how could you do that? What they're saying is, is that your actions do not align with your authority, therefore you are a hypocrite and they call into question our integrity. Our wholeness that is supposed to be reflecting our identity. So here's the next principle though. If you feel the hypocrisy, you will experience what? That's why I, I, I think it's all okay for you to come and be with the church and feel convicted. It's okay, it's not a bad thing. Now conviction is different than shame and guilt and embarrassment. Conviction is like, okay, you know that what you are doing is not who you are and so you fall under conviction. And so I, and that's why I want you to lean into the discomfort. I, I don't want you to go to a place that you never are challenged, that you never fall under conviction because here's the deal is that sanctification is a real thing in the Christian life. 
which means that once Jesus saves us, we are undergoing a process of, of sanctification where he is in the process of molding and shaping us more into his image, which means as we grow in him, we will constantly be convicted. And that's okay. But here's what happens though, is that there are three options that you have in dealing with Christian hypocrisy when you come under conviction. The first option is repent. And that's what he's telling the church at Pergamum. That's what he's telling many of you. That's what he's telling many churches today is I need you to repent. You are walking away from me in this area or these areas. I need you to change your mind and begin to follow me where I become the weightiest thing in your life. But then the second option that you have is reimagine. You can reimagine Jesus. And this is what the Nicolaitans were doing. They were trying to reimagine Jesus in their own mind, in their own eyes. They were trying to construct a Jesus that they were comfortable with. Ring a bell? Oh, that's America. It's American Christians. We're just going to concoct the Jesus we want to concoct so that we feel good about ourselves so that we are not under conviction. But let me just tell you this. If you're going to try to reimagine Jesus into something that he did not reveal, you're bound to go to number three, which is you will relapse and you will become just like the world again. And that is the church in America. There are so many Christians, churches relapsing into worldliness. That's why I lean into the discomfort. Which leads to the fourth thing, and I'll just leave you with this. What happens when they do or do not get back in full alignment? Jesus says, I will soon come to you and I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. If the church at Pergamum does not deal with this heretical doctrine that the Nicolaitans have brought in, Jesus is going to come in war against the church. But then he says, for those who are victorious, to those who are victorious, who, who's victorious? to the ones who remain faithful, fixated, anchored to me and my teaching, who align with me in their actions because I am their authority. To those, I will give hidden manna. They'll never hunger ever again. And to them, I will give them a new name that will give them access to the entirety of my kingdom. Church, are we aligned with Jesus in all of our life, even our actions, because he is our ultimate authority? Will you stand with me as we pray and we are sent out? And here it is. Before you're sent out, I just want you to know we'll have men and women praying. up here, so if you need prayer, come and see any one of them. If you have a physical, spiritual, emotional uh, need for healing in your life, we will have our leaders back in the back praying over you. And so here's basically the benediction. Uh, Jesus, I pray that our hearts and our minds and our entire lives, our whole selves, will be full of integrity, aligned with you. We know that the only way for that to happen though is for the Spirit of God to empower us, to keep our eyes on you and our heart focused on you. So I pray for my brothers and sisters. Will you give them victory? Will you give them assurance? For it's in your name we pray, our King. Amen. You are sent out to be the salt and light of the world.